Hello, welcome back to USS Cod. Today we're up in the conning tower. I know a lot of our viewers have been clamoring for uh, a visit to the conning tower, and this is the first of what I hope will be many visits to the conning tower. Uh, today we're going to talk about steering the submarine. And I gotta say, I think you'll agree, that steering the sub is, is, e is equally important as diving and surfacing. Um, and the fleet submarine is uh, 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 known to have a rather large rudder. In fact, s some of our viewers uh, commented uh, recently uh, on one of our Facebook posts uh, regarding the, um, the uh, ship's propeller key that, boy, that's a big rudder for a small boat. And that's true, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the slower a craft moves, the larger the control surfaces have to be. So a fleet submarine, particularly underwater, is only traveling at best nine knots. So it's going to need a rather large rudder to make uh, uh, quick changes in its course. Um, but remember, these boats are on the surface at least 95% of the time in World War II. So we're going to talk about the uh, standard uh, rudder, how we steer a fleet submarine. Now, earlier fleet subs had actually three different steering stations. Those original massive conning towers included a... Um, steering stand up on the bridge that was exposed to the ocean and the weather. It was enclosed, but uh, it wasn't pressure proof. Um, and uh, they, it was connected through an outside uh, shaft to the uh, helm here in the conning tower. And there's another connection down to the control room uh, where we have the auxiliary helm. And uh, Evan, with his uh, movie magic, will insert uh, uh, a B-roll here of, of the auxiliary helm down in the uh, control room. But um, Cod was built uh, among the last of the Gatos. So we're going to talk about her um, outfit as uh, she was built in World War II. Uh, she goes from, uh, the, the fleet subs go from three to two steering stations. This one here inside the uh, pressure vessel of the conning tower is uh, the main helm. Uh, most of the time, since we no longer, uh, we weren't built with one, but uh, the fleet subs uh, gave up the outside steering uh, very early in the war. So this becomes the main helm, and the auxiliary down in the uh, control room uh, remains the auxiliary. Um, why would you steer uh, down there? Well, primarily if you flood this compartment... Uh, due to some engineering or battle casualty. Uh, you have to abandon the uh, conning tower. You can steer from the control room. But more often, you steer down below uh, when you were running silent. The uh, fleet sub has a wonderful power steering motor in the pump room, as built. And uh, it allows even a small child to spin the wheel. Uh, no problem, they could steer the boat. However, that power steering motor makes noise. And if you're rigged for ultra silent running, you're going to turn that off and you're going to steer from down below. Um, I don't know. Evan, do, do we want to go down there below and we'll demonstrate that in, in, perhaps uh, uh, after we finish up here. But uh, let's talk about uh, the standard steering. So normally you have a helmsman and uh, he does not see where the boat is going. Uh, that's not important. Again, remember, we're on the surface most of the time. So he is basically looking at two rudder angle indicators, the Henschel clock face uh, indicator, uh, which is uh, uh, calibrated port and starboard to 35 degrees rudder deflection. Uh, and you also have a numerical lighted section here. It goes from zero, I think, every, uh, uh, every five degrees. Yeah, zero, five, 10, 15, 20, 25. 30, 35 degrees right and, and left rudder. Interesting right and left, not port or starboard rudder. Uh, most of the time, uh, you're given a compass heading. Now, I want to point out, uh, this is our gyro compass repeater driven by the gyro compass down in the control room. Now, inside this gray clock-like structure is the gyro compass repeater. Uh, but what you see sitting on front of that is a course clock. Now we have to thank Richard Pakelny of the USS Pampanito for this uh, course clock here. Uh, this is the post-war course clock. 
Pampanito is um, equipped with a World War II version, and they're very similar. Uh, the main difference is that after the war, uh, the course clock becomes a little more versatile in the number of course deviation discs you can place in this uh, clock section right here. And basically what a course clock does, you have a cam, and it sort of looks like an amoeba. And uh, they're marked, they're numbered. Uh, you'll open this front section up, you'll mount the cam inside here, and what it does is, uh, as, the, uh, as a time function, a clock ticks around, it will cause the pointer up here to move on seemingly random variations of the course. What that does, it's, it's designed for uh, convoys so that the, all the ships in a convoy can make uh, uh, synchronous uh, course changes to zigzag to throw off any potential submarine attacks. Um, and so that the ships don't run into each other, everybody's moving if they're using cam dog, D for dog, uh, on that day. Um, they're all going to move in a nice ballet synchronization style. Um, but why would a submarine operating alone uh, use a course clock? Well, for basically the same reason. Uh, we're going from point A to B on the surface. We don't want to get snookered by an enemy submarine. So instead of running on a straight course between A and B, we're going to use a, a course clock uh, and it's going to give us seemingly random variations on that base course. We'll still get to point B. It may take extra time and fuel, but it may save us from being torpedoed if uh, we get caught or surprised on the surface by an enemy submarine. So. Um, Course clocks, a big thing in wartime, and this is the immediate post-war course clock, again, thanks to our friend Rich Bacalny. So the, the helmsman uh, is given a, a base course to follow, and, and he's following the uh, basically the, the, the lubber line here as it moves uh, in ran, uh, seemingly random variations on your base course. Now... Um, if this goes down, you do have your, uh, your backup magnetic compass. Um, the, uh, the model we have here has the larger compensating balls. Now, it, I'll be, tell you a little truth. Uh, we should have the model with the much larger balls, but until we can figure out how to move the course clock on its hinge mount a little bit further out, uh, we can't mount the, the correct model that has the larger balls. You'll see that down below, and we're going to do a whole separate uh, uh, segment on, on magnetic compasses. Uh, suffice to say, uh, this is the Pioneer Eclipse model. It was designed uh, for uh, Sherman tanks, but uh, got wide use in submarines. Uh, you have, uh, as I said earlier, the uh, clock face rudder angle indicator. And over here you have your two motor order telegraphs for the port and starboard uh, shafts. And that's more or less the, uh, the uh, gas pedal. But uh, this is the main helm. And it has the little help uh, thing here. But if I ate my Wheaties today, and, and I think the fact that this hasn't been used in a while, uh, the, the, uh, the grease is a little congealed. But that certainly helps you with uh, any uh, uh, large, quick uh, course changes. Uh, Evan, let's leave that sticking out just because I don't want to pull that out again and try to stow that in here. And by the way, ours has uh, some uh, fancy work done. Uh, I believe, uh, well, it's hard to tell because uh, Daryl Flint, uh, one of our crewmen, uh, trained, uh, taught himself to do fancy work. And uh, it's as good as the World War II guys. So I don't know if that's World War II or Daryl. I'll have to check with Daryl. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's just more decorative. It also gives you a little bit of grip ability. Uh, sometimes they would put this uh, small line uh, wrapping around the uh, uh, circumference as well. Uh, but ours is on the spokes. So standing watch, your helmsman is up here. He can't see where the boat is going. I'll stand over here. Uh, if I'm the helmsman, uh, again, I'm looking at my, my course uh, clock. Um, they're calling down uh, course changes through the open hatch up on the bridge. And uh, I'll repeat that and say aye aye. And, of course, uh, uh, steer the boat 
um, accordingly. Now, this is controlling uh, the rudder about 220 feet behind us uh, through um, hydraulic system back aft. Uh, but if we have to uh, run silent, we're going to turn off that hydraulic pump that uh, we have down in the pump room, which again, as I said, makes noise. Now, to work the rudder in manual, um, it's it takes quite a bit of effort. So you're going to use the uh, the lower uh, wheel, the auxiliary helm, uh, because it has less mechanical resistance than this one does to uh, move oil 220 feet aft at the rudder. So. Um, I'll tell you what, let's pause for a moment and we'll go down to the uh, um, uh, control room and, and we'll talk about auxiliary helm. Through the magic of video, we are down here in the control room and we only dropped uh, uh, the camera twice down the hatch and slipped ourselves. Um, we're at the uh, auxiliary steering station here in the forward end of the control room. And as you can see, here is the, uh, the drive clutch mechanism that uh, takes the uh, input from the wheel up of the conning tower down through here. And, of course, we'll uh, uh, transmit it aft uh, with some hydraulic equipment here uh, to the rudder. Uh, but uh, this is the secondary helm. Uh, and again, using that beautiful power steering motor down in the uh, pump room uh, can allow just about anybody to steer the boat. In fact, uh, uh, this has been declutched, but uh, with the power steering motor, this is about as easy as it is to steer the boat. Um, no problem at all. Now, if we have to, as I said earlier, run silent, we're going to turn that motor off and we're going to clutch in the direct drive. And I can guarantee you it's not going to be this easy. In fact, uh, I've been told by crewmen who've had to steer these uh, boats in manual that it takes three men one man at a time will be touching the wheel, uh, but it's without the hydraulic uh, assist motor, it's going to take 10 revolutions of this wheel to give us one degree of rudder deflection, which if is a problem if the captain says, give me six degrees starboard rudder, that is 60 cranks. And I was told that after 10 or even 12 cranks, uh, even the strongest guy is totally winded. So three men are going to be assigned to steer the boat in manual uh, mode. Uh, after the first guy is winded, he's going to step around the table. The second guy takes over. And when he's winded, the third guy will take over. And uh, by the time the third guy is winded, hopefully the first guy has caught his breath. And he'll again come around the table and take over. It is not something pleasant. Um, we've tried to, uh, we have uh, moved our bow plane in manual control with a similar wheel. And I can tell you it takes pretty much a big guy stomping on these spokes here to get it to move. It's not fun. So thank God for power steering. But uh, it's identical to the steering station above. Uh, we have our two motor order telegraphs. We have our gyro compass repeater without a course clock on it. So that'll show you what it looks like. Our uh, uh, Henschel Corporation dial uh, rudder angle indicator and the numerical one right next to it. Uh, these have the bulbs uh, going in them, the ones uh, Top side, I either burned out or we pulled the switch to save power. Uh, we also have our knot indicator. But it's uh, the basic steering. Again, this station also doesn't let you see where you're going. You're relying on uh, input from uh, the conning tower. If you're submerged, uh, likely if you're running silent, you're going to be submerged. You're not going to uh, need to see where you're going. You're, you're underwater and you're relying on your charts. Uh, we have the backup gyro compass here. Again, this will be something we'll cover later. But uh, there is uh, the uh, auxiliary helm. Again, early fleet boats, you have three helms, one up on the uh, enclosed bridge, the uh, second in the conning tower, and the third down here in the control room. And, of course, being a late Gato, Cod has just the two, the main up in the conning tower and the auxiliary gyro down here. So uh, there we are. If you're a, a, a veteran of the old fleet boats, if you have a, a story or any comments uh, to add about steering these boats, please add them in the comments. And as always, uh, remember to hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell, and we'll be back with some more engineering uh, stories about COD. Thanks for tuning in.